It's black, it's big, and it's got a Hemi. The guys will upgrade this 5.7 Ram with a root-style blower and exhaust for more power, then roller on the dyno for proof. That's all today on Truck Tech. Just a few years ago, this half-ton pickup was named Truck of the Year by several national publications. It's a 2013 Ram Hemi 1500. Sharp looks, decent power, and great towing capacity still make this truck very popular today. And a lot of that has to do with price. The sticker on this 2013 with only 8,000 miles was just under 20 grand. And that's great value, especially when you compare it to a Cummins at over twice the cost. Yeah, you get way more towing capacity out of a diesel. But we think we can improve this bone stock gasser with a few performance upgrades. And maybe even improve the look and stance of this truck as well. Let's take it for a ride. All right. Well, we're riding around in this 2013 Ram. Um, it's got the 5.7 Hemi, right? Yep, 5.7 Hemi. You know, pretty good power. I uh, think they rated it. 395 and a little over 400 foot-pounds of torque. So, I mean, to be a stock truck, that's pretty impressive. One thing I've noticed I really like about this truck is the electric steering in it. I mean, it, it's almost like you're in a sports car riding yeah, around. Wow. You get into these curves, I mean, you can literally steer this thing with one finger. It is absolutely effortless. And speaking of the chassis, I mean, how does it handle? We're on a nice curvy road here. Is, is the suspension pretty tight? You know, it's it's pretty tight. It's, um, I guess maybe because I'm a low rider guy, I would like to see it a little lower to the ground. But I mean, to be a stock truck still up in the air like it is, it does handle pretty good. There's not a whole lot of body roll yeah. there. And you know, there's a lot of upgrades we can do to, you know, the suspension and everything to, you know, improve the ride and improve the towing capabilities. I'd be all for that, as long as getting it a little lower to the ground. And, you know, I think this thing's rated at like, 10,000 pounds for towing capacity, so get a little lower to the ground, and I'm sure we can do some air helper springs or something to kind of help help any uh, leveling out we need. Well, speaking of towing, uh, hit the brakes real quick. Let's see how this thing stops. Oh, <laughs> not good. bad to be stock, is it? No, not at all. But you know what? Even though even though it stops pretty good and stock trim. I bet if we throw some rotors and pad upgrades in there, I bet it'll stop even better with a trailer and it'll stop better time after time after time. Sure. Back at the tech center, we're on the chassis dyno at engine power. Now, operating a vehicle on a chassis dyno can be dangerous if you don't take the proper safety precautions. Among other things, my pre-dyno checklist always includes a walk around of the vehicle, double checking the straps before I spin the rollers, and a quick inspection of the tire pressure. Jeremy, you ever run a truck on the chassis dyno before? Not sitting in the driver's seat, I haven't. Well, it's not too bad. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring it up to about fourth gear. That's closest to one to one ratio in your transmission. Um, we're gonna start the test about 2000 RPM. Okay. Um, it's, and all you do really from there is hit the green button and kind of get onto it. Well, not too bad. About 305 horse at the wheels and 324 foot-pounds of torque. That's not bad for a stock truck, but I want, I want more power, though. I don't blame you. Numbers will vary as the truck gets up to temperature, so we'll do several runs. All right, the second run, a little bit less. We got 300 horsepower even and 334 foot-pounds of torque. Let's do another run. We'll get ourselves a good three-run average. Let's do it. And lastly, we've got 310 horsepower and 335 foot-pounds of torque. Not bad at all. That gives us a three-run average of 305 horsepower and 331 pounds of torque. Numbers we certainly can improve on with some power adders under the hood. And the guys will do that next with a step-by-step -step supercharger install. We've got some serious upgrades planned for our 2013 Hemi Ram. And now that we've got it in the shop, we can get started. That's good, kill it. We're gonna be addressing the stance, the load carrying capacity, but first, we're gonna get some power to this thing. Over on the dyno, we averaged 305 horsepower and 331 foot-pounds of torque to the rear wheels. Now that's respectable for a stock truck, but we know we can do a lot better. This 5.7 liter Hemi is a great foundation for what we have planned. 
This is Edelbrox E4 Supercharger for an 09 through 14 Ram 1500 Hemi, and it utilizes Eaton's Gen 6 TVS 2300 rotors. This seven inch long runner allows for maximum low end torque, which is great for us since we plan on doing a lot of towing with this truck. Edelbrox designed their supercharger with an integrated liquid to air heat exchanger. Now this is great because it's going to minimize our inlet air temperatures and it's going to maximize our performance. Yeah, and the great thing we love about this kit, it comes with everything we need to install it. And we're going to start by installing the updated calibration inside this tuner provided with the kit. Let's get started. All right. The first step is to plug the connector into the OBD2 port underneath the dashboard. Once you have that connected and the key in the run position, you simply follow the on-screen instructions to program the computer. This particular tuner will actually make a copy of the RAM stock tune file and save it inside, just in case you ever decide to return the truck back to stock. Some of the major changes inside this new calibration are for the injectors, which are much larger than stock to accommodate the higher power level. The first step under the hood is to disconnect the battery. After removing the grill, Got it? Yep. All right. The first major part to come off the engine is the intake manifold. It's fairly straightforward. There are a couple of PCV and vacuum hoses to remove. Disconnect the plug for the throttle body, all eight injectors, and the map sensor. With the retainer disconnected, we'll remove the fuel line and have a rag handy to catch the overflow. Then remove all the bolts that hold the intake manifold to the engine. Rid of this. It's always a good idea to clean off the mounting flange on the cylinder head and cover the runners with tape so you don't accidentally drop a bolt inside. To break the fan loose we needed a special tool, but since we didn't have one laying around the shop, we made our own. The two tabs on the tool key into the holes on the pulley. We left the belt on for this step to also help keep the pulley from turning. Once the fan is loose, go ahead and remove the belt. Now remove the alternator. Next we'll drain the radiator, move the upper radiator hose and tie it out of the way, then pull out the fan shroud and the fan together. The reason we're taking everything off the front of the engine is to gain access to the crankshaft. On newer engines, there's actually no keyway that'll hold the crankshaft pulley to the crank itself. Now, these modern accessory drives really don't take a ton of power to turn. There's just no need for one. But when you add a supercharger into the mix, the added drag can actually cause that crank pulley to slip on the crankshaft and cause damage. So to prevent that from happening, we'll use this kit from Edelbrock, we'll pin the crank, and we'll solve all our problems. Using this supplied fixture, we are drilling a hole exactly between the crankshaft and the hub of the balancer. After the hole is reamed to size, a little green Loctite is applied and the pin is driven into place, preventing any movement of the crank pulley. We'll replace the factory bolt and torque it to spec. There are three main types of forced induction, and choosing between them can be a little bit confusing. So let's talk a little bit about their differences and why we chose what we did for our 2013 Ram. A centrifugal supercharger is a very popular option. It's a belt-driven impeller, and it produces a very linear boost curve proportional to engine speed. What this means in layman's terms is that low engine RPM, you'll have a low boost pressure, and as the RPMs climb, so will the boost. This would be great for a high RPM street or race motor. A turbocharger looks very similar, except instead of a gear drive, it uses a turbine driven by the engine exhaust gases. Because of that, there is some time delay between when you step on the gas and when the boost builds up. This is known as turbo lag. On a properly designed turbo system, the lag will be minimal and the boost pressure will rise quickly and then taper off at the desired level. Now, turbos are great for all around sporty street vehicles, but a root style supercharger is a type of positive displacement blower and is an entirely different animal. Driven by the crankshaft, it uses interlocking helical rotors that will pump air into the engine. What this means is boost comes up almost instantly to its peak when the throttle is hit and will maintain throughout the entire RPM range. This boost curve is why we chose a root style supercharger for our 2013 Rams towing application. The instant low end torque and response is something that a centrifugal supercharger or turbo just can't deliver. Coming up, there she blows, plus dyno proven power. Stay tuned.
Hey, welcome back. Now that we've got disassembly all complete and we've got our crank pin, it's time to start the fun stuff. We'll get this protective tape ripped off, slide that big supercharger into place. All right, it's about time. Let's get this thing on. I'm ready for it. All right. We didn't forget the gaskets. A good tip, especially if you're doing this job by yourself, lift one side up at a time and slide the gasket in. Yeah, use it down. This is a great way to do this to help prevent tearing the gaskets. You all lined up? Yep, let that real slow. Next, get all the bolts in a few threads or so just to make sure everything's lined up. Snug them down, then torque the bolts to nine foot pounds. The next step is to install our injectors in the fuel rail. Now, since we don't want to take a chance of tearing these O-rings by inserting them dry, we'll give them a little squirt of WD-40. They ought to slide right in. Don't forget before you install the rail to lube the other end of the injectors as well. Once the passenger side rail, injectors, and rear crossover tube are installed, all right, let's see if we can get something in here. We can move on to the front of the engine by reinstalling the fan and shroud. The shroud slides down into plastic retaining clips on the radiator and is secured by two bolts. Reconnect the upper radiator hose and line up the spring clamp to its original position. Our custom tool comes in handy again for tightening the fan clutch. We can now add the last fuel line that connects the fuel rail to the body of the truck. While the alternator is still out, we have access to connect the vacuum hose for the brake booster and the evaporative emissions line. Edelbrock includes a larger idler pulley for improved belt wrap on the supercharger, which minimizes belt slippage. We can reinstall the alternator and hook up its electrical connections. Then the supplied belt can be routed around the pulleys. The factory throttle body is reused, but not the O-ring. Edelbrock supplies a new one, and with that, the front of the engine is done. You may have heard the term intercooler or heat exchanger when talking about supercharger systems and wondered what that's all about. Well, anytime you compress a gas, like air, to force it inside an engine for more performance, the byproduct is always heat. That heat can quickly lead to detonation, which will damage any engine. Now, in order to prevent this, the E4 supercharger includes a liquid-to-air heat exchanger to pump away that extra heat. An electric water pump is mounted near the frame rail with the included brackets. This makes for a nice no-drill installation. The pump draws liquid coolant from the reservoir mounted high up on the engine and forces it towards the front of the vehicle. Edelbrock supplies some nice brackets to mount a radiator or heat exchanger in front of the engine's radiator so it can transfer heat away from the coolant and into the atmosphere. The cool liquid then continues on into another heat exchanger mounted inside the supercharger. The liquid carries heat away from the supercharger and back out front for another trip to be cooled off. Edelbrock recommends that you regap your spark plugs to 35 thousandths, but because this truck has 60 thousand miles on it, we're going to go ahead and replace them with new ones. And since we're going to be in there removing our stock coils to get to those plugs, we decided this was a great opportunity to go ahead and upgrade to these MSD coils for the Hemi. These are MSD blaster coils, and they're made out of upgraded materials and windings, which create a greater spark. And with a stronger spark, you're able to burn fuel more efficiently, which creates more power. The plugs and ignition coil are straightforward to install, and I like to do just one at a time. And remember, whenever you're putting in new spark plugs, use a little anti-seize. A cleanable high flow air filter drops right into place, followed by the PCV hose, then the inlet tube. The heat exchanger pump harness goes on next. Edelbrock supplies the harness pre-terminated so there's no cutting or guesswork. Now the negative battery cable can be installed. 
New coolant from AutoZone goes into the heat exchanger and we reuse the factory coolant in the radiator. The factory grill is a snap to reinstall. And four bolts hold the top edge. The header panel clips on top of the radiator and this finalizes the supercharger installation. All right, Jeremy, hit the key on. Let's check for fuel leaks. All right, fire right up. I would say we're successful. We'll need some gauges to keep an eye on how the engine is running. We got this A-pillar pod and fit it with these gauges from Summit Racing. Up top will be our boost gauge and on the bottom will be our wideband air fuel ratio gauge. This way we can ensure that the engine is always running at proper fuel mixture. We will start by removing the A-pillar trim, then get an idea of where we can run the wires for the gauges. We'll start with the boost gauge as it's the easiest. All it requires is a solid line. Pull it real slow. Run to the MPT port on the side of the supercharger. And a switch 12 volt power source for the lights. Be sure to run the lines out of the way of any heat or sharp edges. Underneath the truck, we have to find a location to mount the oxygen sensor before the catalytic converter. Drill a hole for the provided bung, deburr the surface, and weld it in. After the weld cools, tighten the oxygen sensor and plug it in, and the gauges are done. The last performance modification we're going to make to our Ram is exhaust. Gibson offers this split rear exit stainless steel catback that'll fit perfectly in the cutouts in our Ram's factory bumper. It features mandrel bent construction for maximum flow without any restrictions. And the best part is their Superflow performance muffler will let our blown Hemi operate at its peak and it'll sound great while doing so. We begin by using WD-40 to lube up all the rubber hangers to make the exhaust easier to remove. We'll get the stock tailpipes out of the way by cutting them off at the rear of the muffler with a Sawzall and then we can slide them out of their hangers. Unbolt the clamp at the factory cat-back connection and we'll need a little persuasion to separate the pipes and remove the muffler. There we go. The new system goes into place just like the factory one came out, starting with the muffler and then the tailpipes. We'll install everything loosely at first, check the alignment of the polished T304 stainless tips, then tighten everything down for good. Nothing sets off your project truck like a freshly chromed or painted bumper. You can spend weeks scouring junkyards hoping to find a decent core to be cleaned up and re-chromed. But be prepared to open your wallet since this process can be expensive. LMC Truck offers OE quality steel bumpers that are brand new and ready to bolt on. They come in replacement grade chrome or this extra buff premium nickel chrome for around $200. Or if you're on a budget, one's in primer ready to paint for less than $100. Bucks. Go to lmctruck.com for more. Heat is often the killer of power and performance. Design Engineering combats that heat with their titanium products line of wraps, shields, and boots. It's made from pulverized lava rock and stranded fiber, woven into a protective barrier for fuel and brake lines, hoses, wires, even turbos from direct temperatures up to 1800 degrees. We used it to wrap our diesel exhaust, which sits right next to transmission cooler lines. DEI titanium products are available at most automotive retailers. We couldn't end the day without strapping our Hemi hauler down to the dyno to compare numbers. Now these Edelbrock superchargers come out of the box ready to make big power. But you guys know how we operate here at Truck Tech. We just can't stand to leave anything alone. So we threw on a smaller pulley from Edelbrock to increase our boost. And by doing this, we need a custom tune. So we called Alex from Pikes Performance Tunes out of Houston, Texas. He's an expert at tuning Chryslers, especially boosted Hemis. Well, the tuning software I'm going to use and what I prefer to use in anything I tune is HP tuners. Traditionally, Dodge has always made it a little more difficult. However, um, with HP tuners and their great engineering team they have there, it makes it easy, honestly. After making three pulls to 6,000 RPM, we averaged 431 horsepower and 434 pounds of torque. Overall, that's a gain of 126 horsepower and 103 pounds of torque to the wheels. And we're still not done with this ram. We have a lot more left in store for Hemi Hauler. Thanks for having me.